Good day everyone and welcome to Bidden Family TV. The program is Hope Alive. Yes, there is hope and a new Nigeria is possible. Now, good morning, afternoon and evening, depending on our time zone. We are out here today to talk about what is happening in Nigeria and the reactions that are coming out from the Baptist, coming out from the APC stalwarts about Pitobi's VC to Nasarawa State, Pitobi's VC to Suleja in Niger State, and the several other places that PO is going about doing good. And uh, I, we had a lot of reactions from them coming out. This one is coming from Bashel Ahmad. Let's take it quickly. He said, Pitobi loves dramas. He would have to act in many scripts from now until 2027 and still end up producing an unsellable movie in the ballot boxes. I just watched this latest hit, his visit to a mosque in Yanya where he joined Muslims during their breaking of the Ramadan fast. This is coming from Bashar Ahmad. And this has stirred conversations in the X platform and different other platforms where we now have obedience who are reacting, who are even questioning whether P2B is still content, going to contest the 2027 election. Well, all of these things we want to discuss uh, this morning, plus the fact that there is an attack on the uh, Sanu and the Nasu officials who are actually having a strike, and we have uh, that is happening in the University of Karaba. We have several of more of this coming on, but I'm not the only one to talk about this. I have Divine in the studio. Oh, welcome and thank you for joining us on today's episode. We're so glad to have you. So as we are starting up now, please do like and share this video so that other obedience and well-meaning Nigerians we know that uh, Obedient Family TV is live and also discussing matters that concern PO. So let's get straight before we get to the, um, the attack and the protest of the Unical students. Let's get to what bothers us most, which is uh, the people who are attacking uh, His Excellency p 2 b It's not the first time. It's not as if it's unexpected. It's expected. But then we want to clearly remind uh, people that P2B has always joined Muslims in different areas and locations across Nigeria during the Ramadan to eat with them and to marry with them and to, you know, be in their midst. This is not the first time. But we will get back to that very post and also bring you post that dates back uh, probably about uh, 10 years ago when he was doing exactly the same thing and also what happened in this very soulage but first let me get back to the studio and have this conversation with uh, divine well um, it's really interesting to see because um the agbadoites um, always have something to say when um Peter B or His Excellency Peter B steps out, right? If it's not Ren or Mokui, it's going to be Daniel Bala. Just basically people who are on the lookouts or rather out there trying to solicit for, um, you know, Elon Musk's money because you know Elon Musk right now pays on Twitter. So I don't really pay so much mind to them because I um, just see them as people who are actually out there to um, make a couple bucks from getting retweets and likes and um, there's really no way they're going to garner such clout and such attention unless they are mentioning the name of um, His Excellency P2B. And so even if you're going to be doing all of this good, we expect criticism from people who are enemies of progress and people who actually have nothing good to say about this man. But the facts are there, and this is not the first time he's actually coming out to, you know, join the Muslim brothers in actually celebrating this their fast. He has been like that um, even during his period um, as a governor in Anambra states, right? So we know this, and there is facts to buttress this point. This tweet comes from Oseloka H. Obaze. He says, Nigerians hardly know P2B, the detribalized nationalist. In this 2012 photo as governor, he is breaking fast with the Muslim community in Anambra at the Oka Mosque. I know because I was there and I was the SSG as governors. His ADC and chief security officers were also both northerners. Go and figure, right? And so this tweet was attached with um, a picture of him at these mocks breaking the fast. But that's just to say that um, Peter B is far from a hypocrite like this, um, you know, merchants of lies are trying to paint him as because this is someone who from day one has actually um, believed in you know, the tribalizing Nigeria and he believed that as long as she can do the job, he doesn't really pay much attention to, um, you know, whether or not we're from the same tribe 
or religion like um, the other people actually do. In this picture, we can see him. He's in their midst and he's actually relating to them because he understands that leadership goes beyond, um, you know, political or religious um, sentiments. And so those people who are actually peddling lies in a bit to actually get cheap fame should actually desist from such, from doing such because this man has showed us that um, he is not this as... This picture, um, as you can see, is, uh, is uh, even... Um, about 14, 14 years. This is 2012 and we're at 2024. That's about 12 years. Right. And that, so this uh, very um, thing that uh, Obaze is talking about is actually 12 years ago. So for Bashir Ahmed or whatever his name is coming out to say that uh, uh, Peter B is uh, not going to get himself into the ballots to come 2027. Well, let's get to 2027. We already know you guys are campaigning, but that is not what we're doing. Uh, Peter B clearly stated the reason why he went uh, to... Um, to this very particular Yanya mosque and he also he was very emphatic on uh, why uh, he visited these uh, places you know and he said um, him and his team he, he, he tweeted about this and he said that him and his team had the opportunity of feeding and breaking the Ramadan fast um, of the day with about 1,000 individuals at the Maraba Nyanya International Market uh, Central Mosque symbolizing unity cooperation during that very season and he said these very visits are invaluable opportunities for me i'm quoting peter obi now these visits are invaluable opportunities for me to gain insight into the realities faced by our people many of whom are enduring monumental hardship at this very moment and also to demonstrate the need for leaders to show responsibility and empathy for the people around them. This is very, very two-pronged approach. Right. That is what P2B took here. And like you said um, earlier, it, this is not the first time he's doing this. 12 years ago, even last year, he was doing this. Right. Even earlier of this year, he was doing this. In each time he has the opportunity, he shared it with them. Even in his own birthday last time, mm -hmm. I know he went to an ID camp that is outside of the, uh, of the southeast to celebrate with uh, uh, non-Christian, which are the Muslim brother. Okay. So he said this tribalized uh, person who always look out for people. And uh, thank God that the people of Mina, um, Niger State, uh, Suleja, they all acknowledge that and they say so many things good that you wish to hear from them. Let's take a listen from the people at Suleja. Who scam you? Muslim, Muslim tickets come us. So what do you feel about Peter Obi being here? Yeah, we see, we see everything. Actually, you know, the view, see something. What did he do for you? He make a boss. Boss, not boss. Boss is super here. Are you happy about it? I'm very happy about Tell it. Tell the world. He's the first president that come here mm -hmm. and do something for us. Yes. First contestant of presidents. Talk him. This one, I don't First contestant of presidents that, that, that we see you like him and do like something more. Which one? You see? She she come. What do you talk? What do you talk? What do you do? 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 What the first time. This is my president. I voted for him in the last election. I will still vote for him again because of this. I love it. Help me for life. for life. You can 
just see for yourself. You don't need nobody to tell you. This is real. This is this has this is no propaganda. For 30 years, they've needed water supply here. And Mr. Peter V is giving them, he's breaking fast with them, he's ensuring that they have water. You will hear from some of the videos that I've done right in the mosque here. The Muslim community love him and they're grateful and happy that he came here to be with them. very happy rejoicing mm -hmm. and all of that i mean yes. you can see the joy that comes with somebody they love you think that uh Tinubu or you think that all the others will get to this very place and you see this kind of crowd right um you know i just have a point to make which is um that um if they said that this his act of visiting um these um, Muslims and breaking fast with them and also installing boreholes is an act of hypocrisy. I'd also like to note that um, it's a very expensive form of hypocrisy, to be very honest, because we see that this is somebody that did not just break fast with them. He actually used out of his personal funds to actually install social amenities that the government should have provided to them. And so this hypocrisy is actually very expensive. And um, we don't see this every uh, from the political class in Nigeria. After all, um, we have um, our budget that is slating um, about a, over 180 million for one um you know borehole project and so we can see that it doesn't cost that much because i mean with the way um his excellency ptob is going around and installing boreholes in cities and communities that need them we can also tell that you see that figure that was actually quoted in the national budget is not just some um, you know, it's such a phony and it does not actually represent the true situation of things. But um, that aside, we say big kudos to His Excellency P2B for actually, you know, restoring hope and doing good things. Yes, yeah, so uh, I think um, uh, we have done this. Uh, if, you, if you go to uh, this, the reaction on this very tweet going around, uh, you will actually know that uh, the obedience are not relenting. They are also hitting back. But at the same time, we want to remind you all that anybody that wants to shine, especially those uh, Baptists and um, all those Abado people, they always want to use the name of P2B so that they can have uh, so much reactions to their page. So um, let's just um, uh, know that uh, we don't want to give them credit on all of this. Rather, want to also project his principle. Wherever he goes, are uh, doing good, we want to present that. So we'll come back to that um, because we still have other people who are talking on tweet and the people who are sending uh, their own comments. But let's quickly uh, go to the students' uh, strike or protest that is happening in University of Calabar, where we see a protest happening and actually an attack on the, uh, the Sanu and the Nasu officials there. Let's first uh, see what the video said and uh, some people who spoke over there tell us what they see and what happened over there before we go into the conversation. Currently at the University of Calabar, Unical Cross River State, where members of Nasu and Sanu are observing the seven days national warning strike. We can see a heavy presence of security personnel the strike or the warning strike actually began on Monday and has extended to today. So we are going to speak with some members of NASU and also the leadership of SANU. Students, our students, we were harassed yesterday. Our secretary had been broken, things, stolen items, stolen television, all, so many things, by the, led by the SUG president himself. If the gate is being locked, how would anything be worked? The gate is being locked, shut down. everything is shut down. With the light everywhere is shut down. If the government feels we are relevant, they will attend to our issues. If the students also know that we are stakeholders in this business, they will respect us. If there is no exams, then they cost it. Because one, we wanted the, 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 the nations to hear us and to get the information right. We never went for them, but yesterday we got uh, in, in, uh, information. They came attacking us, attacking our secretary, the student. So if they are doing this, are they really ready for the exams? If they are ready for exams, they should conduct themselves and know their business. They should even cry out for us because we are their parents. We Following what we've showed you from the instruction that occurred yesterday and the interviews that we had with the leadership of NASU and also SANU, we also found it you know, very important to interview the leadership of the student union government. While we left the office, we also got information that um, the main gate and the pedestrian parts were all locked 
And of course, my students are writing exams. I came down from the car, just when I came down, the next thing I heard somebody pointing at me and saying, this is the SUT president. And in, in, in between, when the person said that, it was a slap I got. I got a slap. The next person blew me on my jaw. And slap were coming from left. I didn't know what to do at that moment. If you are national, if you are on strike, you should go home. That's what strike means. Not to come and lock students from writing exams. The reason why we took that action was strictly because we wanted to go back to main gate. I went to main gate with the, the student I, I, I mobilized. We broke the chain and we opened the gates and allowed and asked the student to go in and write the exams. They locked the gate for more than two hours. And the student who had exams, most of them missed their exams. And then we also moved. We got information that they were desecrated. And we went to the cathedral and uh, 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 we went there. We didn't see them. So the students, of course, were angry. And they destroyed, of course, they did. So this is the students uh, attacking uh, the Sanu and the Nasu officials. But there seems like more on this very story. Because from what this very SUG uh, uh, person is talking about has to deal with an exam that is actually happening in the school. Right. And the door is locked and they must attend to these exams. Well, um, I, I understand the need for them to write their exams because, I mean, if I was a student and I had exams to write, of course, it is expedient that I write my exams, right? But at the same time, the point I just want to make is um, related to what I said yesterday because I think there is some form of detachment that the ASU has um, given to this Sano and Nasu um, strike, right? We understand that they are all stakeholders in the education sector. Yes, um, you need the academic staff union of universities, you need the academic staff, and you also need the non-teaching staff, right? And so what affects one affects all. But um, what I don't expect is the fact that they have, um, you know, you know, brought some kind of detachment from it. And by that detachment, they've, you know, um, given a lack of credibility to the Sanu, um, you know, need and what they are asking for. Because if the ASU had at least, you know, identified with their struggle and identified with the fact that, you know what, so these people have not had their, um, you know, salaries paid, at least to some extent, you know, just in solidarity, because these are all stakeholders and we all, you know, wear these shoes. Because when ASU was agitating to have their salaries paid, people actually listened to them. So the Sanu and the NASU, they are very well in their rights to protest. And I just expected that the ASU would have, you know, in form of solidarity, you know, just lended a voice to their, um, you know, needs and giving it some form of credibility to it. Because by this detachment, that is why we are having this issue of fights breaking out. I understand the students having exams to write, but if they had, um, you know, given some form of credibility and just, let's say, in solidarity, say, you know what, we're standing with our, you know, non-academic staff um, brothers and um, fellow workers to demand that their salaries are paid, then we wouldn't have had this clash. But it is just um, a detachment from these people and that is why they lack the credibility that they need to have the federal government ascend to them. Yes, yeah, so uh, well, I think um, moving forward, the Sanu, the Nasu and the, even the Asu themselves should put them, their acts together because the other um, staff uh, or senior staff association or the other association, so to speak, should not be calling students to come and take their exams and then the other part of the association is telling them do not cross the gate. Of course, they are instigating the protest and the lie. And if something did happen to these students, they must be held responsible for their actions. If they want to come together and make sure the schools are shut down, then they should go ahead and do that. But not one of them calling the students, come inside school and have your exams. And then the other one saying, you know what? We are not going to allow you to cross the gate. That shouldn't be happening. And if such a thing happens again in any of the universities, these associations and their scribes, that is their chairman and all their people, should be held responsible by the security um, apparatus and agencies. Now, leaving that very part of this uh, seven days warning strike uh, out, let's dive straight into what is coming out from the United States of America. Everybody should know that the final batch of the El Tunubu's LBI files, final batch, the last expected, the only one that is remaining for them to show, except if they choose to come up with some other things that they want to show. The final batch of uh, uh, Bola Tunubu's LBI files is out.
And this can be gotten through the plain sight uh, website of Aaron Greenspan in collaboration with uh, uh, David Hundain. It's also in uh, West African Weekly uh, that uh, David Hunde is a co-author. So if you want to get the whole documents, there are a whole lot of them, uh, you can get them there. But we want to let you know that this very final version gets the, uh, the investigation, the successful investigation that shows the relationship between uh, the, the, the drug cartel uh, that finally uh, indicted Tunubu and made him to forfeit uh, the 460,000 US dollars in the United States. So this is what uh, David Hunde had to say. He said, the fifth and final installment of the redacted FBI uh, uh, Tunubu's files and his fellow gangsters are building a barrier and the others are now out. And he also directed that you can get all the information uh, from this. He also mentioned Adebo uh, Yegam, Waza Kende, Lee Andrew Edwards, and so many other people who are involved. So please, uh, you can go to plain side, get to the document, and then uh, you can now uh, go through all that is redacted. However, we know the truth, and the truth we know shall set us free. We are still watching forward. I had uh, somebody who actually uh, made mention of um, what uh, the U.S. is actually uh, doing for Nigerian and what they are working with with Tinubu is more of their stooge and um, that is going to affect uh, the Nigerian intelligence um, agency and all of that. It's more of U.S. Uh, redacting these files and then uh, hiding some things and then let Tinubu become their runs boy or whatever that means. But at the same time, we know what has happened. And we will move forward since the authority and the people that are in charge to make these things work are not making it up. So let me just have your perceptive. This is something that we have, you know, kept by our side. Of course, they are going to resurrect come 2027. But at the same, uh, at the same time, for now, these are the last batch of the files that is showing that Tinubu has a connection with a drug and a heroin distribution gang in Chicago, USA. Well, um, you know, the matter is an open secret and, um, you know, the totality of the public has access to these um, sites, like you rightly said, um, plain sites, and these um, files are in the open. So if you're interested, the previous files have been released and we have made our own coverage of this. And so it is in plain sight. You can actually, just like the website actually says, plain sight, the matter is actually in plain sight. And we can actually see the people that are indicted, the Lee, Andrew Edwards, and um, the Muiz or Muaz. Um, we just know that these are people who are of the same quote-unquote cartel and those are the same people who have been indicted alongside um chief bola ahmed sinubu right and um the people who were meant to actually make something out of this case or make use of this information actually declared him um you know our president and um, it is what it is and so we have to wait till the next um election to actually reclaim our mandates or you know use our voters' cards to actually make any useful change. That's if the bodies involved will actually let this change to be, um, you know, made. Yes, yeah, so, and um, while we are waiting to go on what is happening with the, uh, with the budget padding, let me also uh, get some reactions that are coming out on the, um, uh, to us now. We have this uh, Kessiena Coco uh, who says 30 years that is talking about the PO's borehole project in um, Suleja. He said 30 years no borehole water. It is well. If this is eye service, it is eye service at its peak. He should continue with the eye service so because a lot of governors are not doing their job. Well, thank you uh, so much, uh, Coco Kassiana, for giving that kudos to His Excellency P2B for doing a marvelous job of not. And we have more and more people who are also sending in their tweet. But uh, quickly, let's take um, parallel facts uh, analysis of this very uh, budget, uh, the, the padded budget on their own times. Credit to parallel facts.
The Nigerian Senate recently approved the 2024 budget, increasing it from 27.5 trillion naira to 28.7 trillion naira. The breakdown of the budget is as follows. Aggregate expenditure, 28.78 trillion naira. Statutory transfers, 1.74 trillion naira. Recurrent expenditure, 8.77 trillion naira. Capital expenditure, 9.99 trillion naira. After submitting the report, the Senate formed the Committee of Supply, which reviewed and approved the budget. Here are more reported allocations. 427 boreholes for 82.5 billion naira. This means that each borehole will cost 193 million naira. 1,150 streetlights for 212 billion naira. This means that each streetlight will cost 184 million naira. There are also 130 ICT projects with a value of 30.95 billion naira. There is also a 7.61 billion naira budget for empowerment of traditional rulers. In addition, new information reveals that 47.5 billion naira was allocated within the Ministry of Education's budget. The allocation was intended for refurbishment and supplying educational materials to 50 schools across Nigeria. Reportedly, crucial details, including the specific locations of these schools, were absent from the budget documentation. Senator Abdul Ningi from Bauchi Central raised concerns about the insertion of projects serving personal interests rather than national significance. The report claimed that there are no detailed project allocations for 3.7 trillion naira. The allegations sparked a debate during a plenary session. Tinubu's government has debunked Ningi's claim. They stated that the National Assembly increased the amount by 1.2 trillion naira only. Amid the controversy, Senate President God's Will Akwabio's constituency got 21 billion naira projects. This has unearthed other severe corruption allegations against him. Some have even called for his resignation. Senator Jaribe Agong Jaribe also revealed something interesting. He disclosed that certain senior senators received 500 million naira each from the budget. His microphone suddenly went off while making his claim. Budget. A civic tech non-profit organization released a report alleging budget padding by the National Assembly. Meanwhile, Senator Ningi has been suspended for three months. That is a uh, special coming <clears throat> from the parallel facts and uh, credit to them. Uh, moving forward, uh, let's say agitation has started arising from the repressal attacks that is coming out from the Niger Delta region of um, Delta State and uh, going forward to Bielsa State. But like we said between yesterday and the day before yesterday, we keep advocating, advocating for calm in that very um, communities where these things are happening. Because insiders report are coming out from there that uh, other uh, uh, civilians who lost their lives are in their uh, in more than 50 that lost their lives and uh, but thank god some of their elderly statesmen have started talking out loud and other people have joined the conversation on why the uh, military to shoot shoot their sword yes we all uh, held our gallant officer who are doing their job well we also commiserate with them on the loss of lives recorded by the military as we know today the flag on the on the force headquarters of the military is down and um, that signify the imp impact of that very particular incident that happened in uh, delta state and uh, also uh, in Bielsa state however they are talking. Some people are talking, where is Asare Dokobo now? We have even the Ijo Youth Council talking about the military to shed their sword because of the repressive attacks. Let's take a lesson from them as we move forward. My appeal to our gallant soldiers is that they should temper, they should act, um, much shortly, and not to take the law into their own hands. I know they are provoked. We are all provoked. But that's not enough. They are innocent children. 
pregnant women everywhere. So as far as I'm concerned, we should appeal to the military to take it easy. They have all the te um, modern technology. They should be able to fish out very soon those who committed this crime. So it's not against the ordinary citizens. They should, one will be angry that such, such a thing did happen in a place. So one will not blame the army so much for what, whatever that must have happened. It's all collateral damages. What I'm saying, enough is enough. The, the military should sit back. We are all Nigerians. And uh, those who must have been responsible for this, there are not many. There are not many. Whoever hired them, wherever they come from, they should be fixed out. That should be the main duty of the army. And we must all, I think Nigeria should um, get of these gallant soldiers by declaring a day for them with half mast all over the country. Officers and soldiers, innocent men, who went for peaceful settlement of, an, of a matter. We appeal to the military to take it easy that their own people, and they, these are some of the things they, they are expected to have, to encounter. They, are not, they did not die at war front. They were killed cold blooded. So as far as I'm concerned, I will appeal to Mr. President, who is the Commander-in-Chief, to appeal to, also to appeal to the soldiers to take it easy while looking for the, uh, to the people who committed this heinous crime. By Edwin Clark, and we also heard that some of the Ejo Youth Council are also working on this uh, to persuade the military to shed their sword on the repressor attack. Though the military has, as always, uh, said that they are not having a repressor attack, but they are searching for the culprits, the people who actually undertook this. But yesterday again, we heard from Senator Abibio that the people who did this are missionaries and not from this country. So a lot of things that are coming up, but we seek to get reports uh, let them open up the road that goes into these communities. Let investigators and the reporters go in to get uh, the news that is actually authentic so that the public can know what actually transpired at that very place. Moving uh, forward, let's look at what the National Identity Management Commission, NIMSI, the report coming on says that NIMSI has, uh, their portal has been leaked and majority of uh, Nigerian people's information has gone out uh, to the people who are not supposed to have this information. They are vulnerable to scams and are vulnerable to so many things. I don't know what your thoughts on this is because it's becoming a very big news around uh, the whole uh, internet. Um, well, a um, major shout out to um, Fisayo Soyombo for um, the work he's doing in this um investigative journalism right and so it is just very sad because we keep talking about banditry and kidnappings and all of that but it's just sad that the people who we trust with our credentials and who we give our credentials in a bid to actually do the whole national identification um you know registration the system we put uh, you know, credentials and our information on these platforms thinking that it is safe. But these are the same people who have compromised this website and have exposed it to hackers and people of, you know, gullible means or people who have um, bad intentions towards these Nigerians, right? Um, in a publication on Friday, the um, Foundation for Investigative Journalism, of which um, Fisaya Soyobo is the editor-in-chief, had actually published earlier and said that um, a website, a private owned website under the name of expressverify.com actually had access to thousands and millions of um, credentials and information about Nigeria. And it just triggers me on another level because a lot of these things are actually very unfounded. And it's just very sad to see that this body that we have trusted with our information actually goes around for cheap box to actually sell our information to private owned websites who knows they're going to sell this information to people 
people of you know questionable character and one day someone wakes up to the news that oh you were scammed and you don't know how it is this money was moved but it is because the national identity management commission to which we trusted our um, information and our credentials, actually thought it was um, wise enough to actually sell this information to people. And it's just very sad to see because recently, um, Chief Bola Ametinubu named Mrs. Koka Odusote as um, the um, you know, managing director or the CEO, um, as the case may be, of this NIMC. And she actually shut down these um, sites. Previously, it was shut down because security checks were not put in place and people could assess, unauthorized agents could actually assess these websites. And it was put down because of that. And they said they were going to open it when they had sorted out all security bridges. But by the time they installed this person, she was impressed on by some officials who had, um, you know, um, ulterior motives to actually reopen this website and they reopened it without actually making the proper security checks and so the um, information available to us is that private individuals can actually assess our information on the NIMC website and now we are now very much um, open to being scammed and being even kidnapped because anybody who has access to your NIN can have access to your BVN and who knows you are the mercy of these hoodlums and it's just very sad to see I personally want to take um, a remark from someone who works in the NIMC who actually pleaded anonymity. The person didn't want to be mentioned, but the person actually mentioned and the person said that um, kindly be informed that the NIMC has actually enlarged the use of NIN verification services across all industry and has reopened the NVS for registration. And this is what they said when um, Mrs. Um, Koka Odusote was actually um, reinstalled or rather installed as the CEO, right? Now she said that um, all the reports listed about data vulnerabilities are a cover-up and it would be wise to conclude that the current CEO has no clue what she's doing as she's listening to folks who are only interested in their pockets. Otherwise, such a memo would have never been issued. Bottom line is NIMC does not permit any raw NIN verification. The tokenization is user consent management and without the ID holder providing their explicit consent, you can't get the data and you have to ask first and be given a virtual NIN card which the consent with the consent token. The person actually went for that to say that I can assure you that there are very minimal controls in place. The staff at the NIMC are the developers of the NVS solution and some created a few backdoors for themselves as there are no visibility beyond what they wish for anyone to see. Yes, so uh, if we continue on and on and this, uh, another hour will go by. But our time get limit and that signal don't come. So what in that one mean be say NIMC people will get our information. The way where on they carry our information they go, make on a stop and make on another they give uh people will no get authorization access to this very NIMC uh verification norms, number what they call a beg. And our people wherever on a day make on a day careful with on a name and all the other things. But make on a go check out if it's a yours um, post and also read the content of this very leak because then talk say the thing don't leak already. And if it don't leak, now say your BVN they compromised. To what extent we are still diving into that very position? But until then. Make we finally tell and say we won't come out for studio now until we come back again. But before I leave, the promise when I give obedience, say I go to do every day and well meaning Nigeria that one now to tell every obedience and well meaning Nigerian that we have now started our coming together as opposition in preparation for 2027, and that is the formation of. Uh, obedient Family Cooperative Society. Yes, Obedient Family Cooperative Society. It's expected that the registration should happen in all the local government. I think we have about 774 local governments in Nigeria. So wherever you are, please indulge us uh, to be the first person to take the lead in your local government. And that platform is intended to bring all the obedience together. Now, joining from this initial setup, we have opened up a community platform on WhatsApp, which clearly should be at the description of this very particular program or this very video. So indulge us by going there, 
clicking on the link of that WhatsApp platform for us to join the community to understand where how we are moving forward, the objectives that we have for staying together. And we also have a meeting, second meeting, coming up this Saturday by 9 p.m. The Zoom link will be posted on Friday. That should be two days from now. It will be posted for everyone to join at the meeting by 9 p.m. Objective is coming together to fight this hardship and poverty together under production for consumption. Under production for consumption so that we can survive this next uh, three years to 2027. God willing, we will all hit them back on what they have given us. Of course, God being with us. Until we come here again this evening. Bye for now. Oh, <laughs>